uh, in December, hard to believe that December is only a little ways away and uh, Thanksgiving has come and gone and, and uh, I heard we had an election too, by the way. That happened a little while ago? Hasn't been decided yet, but I heard that we had an election, so praise the Lord, waiting on all those type of things. Your, your life at uh, Thanksgiving, I'm sure, was a little bit different this year. Uh, Cheryl and, and I and uh, uh, Kathleen, Christine, uh, and Herschel and uh, the kids, we're going to head up to Rochester, New York and uh, go visit Cheryl's dad. Grandpa turned 80 on November 1, but uh, the United Socialist Republic of the state of New York, run by uh, Mr. Cuomo himself, decided to make it uh, almost impossible uh, unless you want to spend, you know, a whole month there waiting to get tested six different ways. Uh, that's an exaggeration. But again, as I say often, I'm a preacher. Uh, you give me a little bit of grace to exaggerate a bit. But uh, just so you know, state of New York, to go in there, you have to fill out paperwork or do it online. And then when you check into the hotel, you have to turn in your paperwork. Your paperwork must say that you have a negative test in the last 72 hours. And of course, if you're driving up there, then you're going to make sure you get underneath the window. And then you have to be tested again before you leave the state. To make sure that, again, that's just one of the things that we went up against. So we decided just to hang out and go to Missouri. Praise the Lord. By the way, be thankful for the Midwest and where you live. People and friends in the state of New York, New England, where I'm from. My sister lives in California. Why in the world did my family decide to live in New York and California? And New England, where I'm originally from, is uh, crazy, but... We give thanks, and we're very, very thankful. And uh, thank you, God, for sending me to the land of the free and the home of the brave. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's the whole country. I'm sorry, I, but Missouri, I guess it's all right. This thing, Doc, if you're still in Wisconsin, man, they might have locked you up. Yeah, or just flamed your, burned down your doctor's office. Kenosha, one of the most peaceful, most beautiful places in the whole wide world, where God rested on the seventh day, from what I understand, uh, after New Hampshire, of course. But, uh, yeah, this just, uh, so we sing about the Lord. We come and worship our holy God. And if you think about one of the passages that we use, and we'll look at a Colossians 3 here in a minute, and when I read it, you go, just a reminder that that teaching and admonishing in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, when you sing those songs, they admonish. They teach. That's what the Word of God does through song when it's lined up with the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit of God is using the Word of God to teach one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And that's part of what we gave thanks for last week. So just a quick three-minute review, Reader's Digest review, just to remind you of where we've been. He is doing it. Let's give thanks. And today we're going to continue for his glory. He is doing it. We said, hey, look at what God did over this whole year. And we looked at some of the different bits and pieces. I want to put a couple of slides up here in a moment to remind you through the teaching and preaching of the Word and through different groups and different things. We looked at that last Sunday when we said, let's give thanks. On Sundays, there's been a lot of good things, a lot of, in fact, glorious things unto the Lord. And so we're going to continue to do what we're doing. No matter what, God would uh, uh, interrupt us because God would allow something to interrupt us. We'll continue to do what God would have us to do. And so we gave thanks for our Sundays, last Sunday, and the Sunday before that, we said, just let's pay attention to what God is doing. God is doing it. And so those two messages are good, not overly convicting to the personal place of us, but rather a Thanksgiving message, and that's always a good message. And, and of course, the, the one before that, just giving praise to God for all he's done. Well, this week, it should be a little bit more personal for us continuing for his glory, continuing. And we're going to see in Acts chapter number two here in a moment what it means to continue for his glory. But let me remind you of how God at the beginning of the year led us to nothing beyond his grace. It's beyond his grace. I know we've mentioned it a little bit. It was uh, uh, the king's reign, King David, and we looked at that for 40 years. And no matter how everything went, God continually restored his relationship with the king, and no matter what went on, he restored and knows how to restore those believers in him. Restore and put together, back together his children. 
He then went into a, a Bible study on Wednesday night. Some of you joined on Zoom. A lot of you came in person. It was a great time in the book of Nehemiah. A great study on leadership and a great study about prayer. The victorious Christian life. How does God restore the body? And as God put upon your pastor's heart to say, let's just let God restore the body of Christ. We saw him do that. And one of the places was through our Bible study, going 60, 70 minutes a week in the Word of God on Nehemiah, chapter by chapter, line upon line, God restores his body. God restores his church. So God restores believers. God restores his body. God restores his children. God restores his church. And then, of course, we went into our Sermon on the Mount study, and we became a little bit more personal with our teaching of the Bible in terms of what Jesus Christ was speaking about to, of course, that Jewish audience, but he also, of course, had his disciples around him as there was multitudes and also to his disciples. And he was teaching of the kingdom, the kingdom to come, and the fact that they, the audience, could not in any wise be able to be righteous enough to enter into the kingdom on their own. And he was really teaching them about the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ through holy God that was standing before him. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So it really reminds you, boy, we try to live this kind of great life in the Lord without the close relationship with Jesus Christ. And of course, then that led us to our study in the book of Colossians, our last study on Wednesday nights for the year. And we've entitled it, only Jesus. Because as we look at the study, we realize that God is all about the church. And his life, the life of the church, and how the life of the church is really based upon the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be said by many that Colossians may be the one book of all 66 that truly uh, is the most Christ centered book. And so when you think about it, you go, wow, that's a good study. Well, we've got three more Wednesdays to come. Come and join us on Zoom, join us in the coffee house, and uh, uh, let's continue to have God work in our hearts and show us that Jesus Christ needs to be preeminent in our lives as a church, his bride. And then we had the Acts 1A conference. What a great time around the word. Do you realize that's almost two months ago? By next Sunday, it'll be two months ago that we had the Acts 1A conference. Brian is over in Africa. The chippies are here. Pretty soon they're going to switch addresses. The chippies are going to go back to Africa the first part of uh, January, and Brian will be coming back uh, at the end of January, uh, third or fourth week of January. And so you think about all that went on and has gone on in our conference and the time that we spent really just centering up on thank you, God. And each piece of that pushed us in a place where we need to be challenged. What is the faith? of those like Paul and Peter and John and all those that have gone before us really mean to you as an example? Is it so uncommon for their faith to be something that would be exemplified by us? So again, we continue. We continue for his glory. Well, pastor, how does that fit in here? Well, let's look at Colossians chapter number three and answer this first question. I want to read verses 12 down through 17 as a reminder of what we covered, and I want to ask you a couple of questions. Put on, therefore, verse number 12 in Colossians 3, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against you, against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So we're forbearing one another, and we're forgiving one another. Great verse, verse number 13. Verse number 14, an even better verse. I mentioned this in last service. I, I think that this verse ought to be mentioned a great deal in marriage. And above all these things, put on charity, that unconditional agape love, which is the bond of perfectness. The Lord Jesus Christ's love makes a marriage perfect, complete, wholesome. That love, that charity love that people give to one another without keeping score. Verse number 15, 16, 17. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. 
Wow, that's even a good verse for marriages. Gosh, this is really good. I'm not preaching on marriage today. I'm just joking. But look at verse number 16. I love this one. Above all, I think, would be nice to say, but we won't add to the word. We'll just let it speak for itself. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, here's that statement I mentioned earlier, teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's kind of the way you're singing today and singing those words. They teach and admonish. I was mentioning it earlier. You're singing songs. Oh, victory in Jesus. That you're singing that and that admonishes and teaches. And that's part of letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It should be an overflow. And then verse number 17, something that we should memorize. And whatsoever you do, in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So we covered those six verses when we looked at everything that uh, the last couple weeks, when we said, hey, he is doing it. Let's give thanks. Now we continue for his glory. So let's progress through that for a moment. Let me ask you, what is God doing in your life? It's a good question. In fact, it's commonly used to start a conversation. It's used by people oftentimes to say, hey, hey, what's going on with you? Uh, sometimes it's kind of like, unfortunately, we, we ask it and then we, we leave the matter before someone has a chance to answer. Hey, how you doing? Uh, how you doing, Bobby? Uh, oh, I, I don't have time to listen to your answer. Sometimes people go, what's God doing in your life? But they don't stop to listen. So I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to stop to listen for the next minute or two. For all of you, somebody jump in for me. This is class participation. What is God doing in your life? Anybody? What's God doing in your life? Anybody? Jump in. Yes. Building a home in Jesus Christ. It's sweet. Building a home. That's a good one. What else? Getting the word out. That's a good one. What else? Getting a license for a better job. What kind of job? CDL. Oh my gosh. You need to make money and everything like that. What is God doing? God's getting you an opportunity to make money for a good job. Yes. You're learning the lesson about God blessing and blessing and blessing. And God is saying, I'm working in you to show you what I can do for you. What is God doing in your life? Pam. He's providing for you. He's taking care of you. <coughs> Very strong cough drop, by the way. It's the elixir of the throat when you have to preach. Hey, listen, even if you're not sick, you've got to have a, like, a little Hall's mentholiptus. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Feels good. That's Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Okay, so that's where we look. Next question. Here you go. What have you given thanks to him for? What have you given him thanks for? Yes. You're giving him thanks for Jesus. You've been doing that a lot? That's a good idea. I heard that would be something we ought to do daily. Yes. Thanks for good health. I heard that would be a good one. What else? Amen. Amen. For living in a country where they haven't shut your mouth yet. For Jesus Christ. <laughs> I had to add that because some of us, you know, as you chuckled, we haven't been quiet. We sometimes, though, forget the incredible freedom. Go to some places where you can't speak like you speak here. What else? What have you given him thanks for? Anybody? Yes. His faithfulness. That's something we ought to be thankful for all the time. Nathan, what do you give God thanks for?
your rich father, you said? No, I, I'm just joking. Don't tell him. Oh, gosh, I'm in trouble now. No, for your family. How about the niece that you have? Woo! Niece is big. Yay! Future wife. I hear that's a good thing. Listen, when you and I look at the scriptures again, like we did last week, and we lay down again our thanks for God, it should be something that is a past tense, I did it yesterday, a present tense, I'm doing it today, and if God gives me tomorrow, I'm going to give him thanks. Now open up your mind and heart to the idea that miserable people are people that do not give thanks. Let me do it this way. People that are ungrateful, unappreciative, and unthankful are grumpy, miserable, and difficult to be around. So if you're like that, just, just know you're going to be by yourself for a while. Time to turn it around a little bit. Thankful, appreciative, grateful, and people will love to be around you. Isn't that true? People that are not thankful are not attractive. Just remember that as Paul's teaching the church at Colossae to be thankful for Jesus. Now here's your question for today. Go to Acts chapter number 2. Here we go. Acts chapter number 2. Little Bible study for the next 20 minutes. Here we go. Pay attention to how God's going to show us something from his scriptures about how we are to continue. What will you do to continue for his glory? Now that's a future tense question, which means that if I ask you that, you might not have an answer. And all of you that are listening in uh, online or whatever, just, just think right now for a moment. What, what will you do to continue for his glory? Because if you're doing something now that's for his glory, you need to continue it. If you're doing very little for his glory, then you ought to start. But if it says in Colossians 3.16, excuse me, 3.17, whatsoever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. This should be something that's going on in my life regularly and in your life regularly. What will you do to continue for the glory of God? There was this young man by the name of Abraham Lincoln that in 1863 wrote an incredible proclamation. I won't read it all, but you ought to look it up. The year, that is drawing, the year that is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthy sky, healthful skies. To these bounties, which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they came, others have been added, which are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and even soften the heart, which is habitually insensitive to the ever-watchful presence of, of Almighty God providence of Almighty God. Abraham Lincoln continues. Let me read just one other little part of this. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledge what? The gifts of the Most High God. And he's referencing from his paragraph before. And they should be acknowledged with one heart, one voice, by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States, and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands, to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving. And praise, listen, to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for our national perse per uh, perseverance and disobedience, perverseness and disobedience, command to the, his tender call all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged. And he continues on and on. If you read that, and some of you probably have looked that up, talking about the proclamation from October 3rd, 1863 for Thanksgiving, then you'll realize how thankful this man was and how he was pointing this country to continually give thanks. Think of the principle continually. They started it in 63. We're still having Thanksgiving Day, the last Thursday of November, every year in America. That's the kind of stuff that, and of course, I know that that's for America. That's 
based upon an American statement of being thankful. But how, how would it be if we looked at the Word of God and said, Okay, Lord, look at what you have done for me. Look at how you have worked in me. In fact, the people that went before me in the first century early church, what did they do? And how would I apply in my life what they did to continue for the Lord's glory? Well, let's find out from the Word of God what we can see about continuing as the early church did. Verse number 41, chapter number 2 of the book of Acts. It says in verse 41, They that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. The church has begun. Verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Real quick, right there, just a quick, there's a great outline right there. You want a great message? What do you continue steadfastly in? Well, you identify what it means to continue steadfast, and then you find out what the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers are, and you continue in those things. We'll look at that in a moment. It goes to verse number 43. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Verse 44. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. Verse 46 and 7. And they, continuing daily. So there's the statement, continued steadfastly and continuing daily. When you look them up in your concordance, you'll find that they are tied together beautifully like brothers and like sisters in their terms. Continued steadfastly, continuing daily. They continued daily with one accord. House to house did eat their meat with excuse me, breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God. And then they had favor with all the people. And it says then that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We've been referencing this passage of Scripture quite a bit as we continue for His glory. And we will hear a little bit more from that as we make steps into 2021 as a church. What does the pure, raw, unrehearsed church look like in Acts chapter number 2? It looks just like this. And it says that they continued steadfastly. So, I put the verse up on the screen. It's a, 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 a renew or a, a, a refocus on what the statement is in the beginning, which is this. They continued steadfastly. Simply put, today... For the next few moments, I want you to ask yourself, is this the kind of Christian that I look like to other people? Do I continue steadfastly? Am I the one who they could point together with this group of people almost 2,000 years ago and go, wow, yeah. Well, they, they, were, they were just so, so raw, so, so, so fresh to Christianity, they didn't have any idea what they were going to do, and, and then they really didn't know what it meant, and well... The gospel of Jesus Christ, the apostles' example, the Holy Spirit of God, and they're learning immediately what to do. They continued steadfastly. The word and terminology of continuing steadfastly simply means this, and I say simply with tongue in cheek, to adhere to one, be his adherent, to be devoted or to be constant to one, to be steadfastly attentive unto to give unremitting care to a thing, to continue all the time in a place, to persevere and not to faint. They continued steadfastly. So a couple of things out of this verse, and then we'll look at verse number 46 and pull a couple things out of there. They continue steadfastly. If we're to continue for His glory, continue steadfast, persevere, not faint, our consideration, hmm, should I do it? Hmm. Our consideration needs to be implementation. They, the church, the early Christians, their consideration over what they ought to do was met with a desire to implement things. Look at some of the verses I have here. Join me 
as we just walk through some of them. I'm going to read them and move through them quickly. John 8, verse number 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus directly says that if you are the one that is going to believe on me, you need to continue in my word. What a great statement. Go to John 15, verse number 9. Jesus is addressing his apostles. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. So right off the bat, continue in his word, continue in his love. Two things. The Bible's teaching itself as it always does. Get out of the way and let the Bible do the work. Watch this. Acts chapter number 13. What does he want us to do here when it comes to continuing steadfastly? When you look at, again, what does the scripture say? Well, it says Acts 13, 43. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in The grace of God. So, we're going to continue in the word, right? Is that good? We're going to continue in the word. What are we going to continue in next? Love. Don't forget that one. Somebody mentioned that earlier. What are we going to continue in here? Grace. Keep keep track. Watch this. Acts 14, 22. Just turn a page. It says there, in confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. Continue. Continue steadfastly. Do you continue steadfastly? Is that one of the things you're going to say, Lord, I'm going to continue for your glory steadfastly? Again, the challenge is very, very clear. As you go on and on, go back to, if you wanted to go to Colossians chapter number one, it says, if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a, made a minister. You're to continue what? In the faith grounded and settled. So it's a reinforcement of what it says in Acts 14. Each piece and part of what God is teaching us means we need to continue for his glory. Why? Because it's what the early church did. And there are examples, and there were Christians a long time ago before you and me. And our consideration in looking at that is implementation. Look at the word of God and implement it. I know we use this word application. How about implement, implementation? Put it into practice a little bit further. Similar word, synonym type of word, but implement. You need to put, and I need to put, my actions against the word of God and say, do they measure up? Do they measure up to what they were talking about, what the Word of God's telling me? Because I'm supposed to continue. Word, love, grace, faith. And then we see back in Acts chapter number 2 how he has stated continued, 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 steadfastly. Well, again, when he goes back to the meaning of the word steadfastly, to adhere to one, to be its inherited, an adherent, glue. Stuck, stuck on you, Lord. I'm going to continue steadfastly. Doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. Well, the next piece that I see here in Acts 2.42. We are to continue for his glory. Our verification is supplication. Brother Dwayne was preaching on identification with the Lord a few weeks ago. We are to verify our life in the Lord by continuing in his glory. How do we do that to verify? You say you love the Lord. You're going to continue steadfastly. Well, these are some really cool verses. Acts chapter number 1. Go there. We're not far away. We're in Acts Acts 1, verse number 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brethren. Jesus Christ has appeared to them, he's given them their challenge, he's given them the command, and then, just before the Holy Spirit of God is going to be coming, and the day of Pentecost and the promise, they get together and pray. Acts 2.42, we already looked at that. Acts uh, 2.46, we're going to look at here, we just read it. Go to Acts 6.4. You know what it says here in regards to the apostles and what they are doing to free up to be able to continue what they're doing 
by getting some deacons together in the church. So you've got Acts 6-4. But we, the apostles, will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Hmm. Am I going to continue to do that? Are you going to continue to give yourself to prayer and the ministry of the word? Acts 8.13. What does it say in Acts 8.13? Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. He continued following because he had seen something incredible happen, but of course, he came to the Lord. Again, the verification is in supplication. What is it about your walk that would tell everybody that you truly are a believer continuing in something? Well, I talk a good game, but what if the person knew that you were a person of prayer? In Acts chapter number 4, verse number 2, you don't have to turn there, I can read it for you. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Continue for his glory. Our verification should be in our supplication, in our prayers, in our thanksgiving. Everybody, what are you going to continue to do? We are, as a church, going to continue for his glory. Okay, Acts chapter number 2. Go back there with me. Acts chapter number 2, verses 46 and 47. What does the word of God say for us here? As we continued steadfastly, now we see continuing daily. What do you do every single day? Daily you wake up, daily you do something. Is it all for his glory? The Bible says whatsoever you do, in word or deed, Mark Brown, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Is that true for my life? What about your life? What about our life as a church? Do we continue for his glory by doing all the things that we do daily, continuing daily? We eat every day. We get up for a job every day. We pay our bills. We check maybe a few pieces and parts of social media. We play our fun video games or little apps that we have on our phones. We take care of our children. Well, I don't anymore. That's a pretty good deal. My kids are all grown up. But some of you that have little ones, ha <laughs> ha. You gotta take care of your kids every day. What a deal. Or you take care of your grandchildren, which is the best thing in the whole wide world. But what do we do daily? It says in verse number 46 and 47, it's up on the screen. Follow along with me as I read it. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat with meat their glad with gladness and singleness of heart. Many say that. The breaking bread was of the Lord's Supper. Yes, that's part of it, but that's not the only part of them breaking bread from house to house because they did eat meat with gladness and singleness of heart. It's more built upon the idea that, hey, guess what? When you get together and you do that oft as you do, do it in remembrance of me, but also, too, when you break bread, you should commune over the table being the Lord's table always. That the conversation should be about the Lord. It should be an ingrained effort for you and I, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, to eat with meat, gladness, and singleness of heart. He's saying, look, this church was always talking about Jesus Christ. They were always getting involved with praising God, as it says in verse number 47, and having favor with all the people. This is the way it ought to be for us. They say, well, you're just giving me a history lesson, and that's good history. You give me nice doctrine, and that's, that's a nice doctrinal type of lesson and good theology, but where is the application? It's for you and I to say, are we continuing daily with one accord each and every day and showing people how important being in a place of uncommon faith is? Again, when you line up continuing daily with continued steadfastly, they both come together with this idea to continue all the time in a place, to show oneself courageous for something, to be in constant readiness for one, wait on constantly. As it says, when we get together for one accord, it should even go further. What does it mean to be of one accord? It means that we're to have one mind, one thinking, one unified body. You say, well, that keeps on coming up. Well, if you read your Bible, then a lot of these principles continue to come up.
because Paul the Apostle, when he wrote, when Luke the Apostle, when he wrote, when these guys wrote the Word of God by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they were constantly teaching us the things that you and I need today as much as back there. To continue for His glory, our de declaration, what we declare is unification. You see, our words, we've spoken of this, our words should be unifying. There should be one mind, one thinking, one commonality. What is our declaration to everyone around us as a church? We are unified. We ought to be. We've spoken of this principle to give thanks for one another, to give thanks for the church. If we're to peel back some of this stuff, I believe that we realize that the unity as the way we ought to see it or the way it ought to be in our declaration would make a difference. I believe when you declare something, you've got to live up to it. And of course, in the book of Acts, there's a number of references about continuing with one accord. And again, verse number 46 is what we got before us. In Acts chapter number 4, it mentions it. And of course, it mentions in Acts chapter number 5, by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. In chapter 7, Verse number 57 of Acts, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. The people were with one accord. Chapter number 8, verse 6, gave heed unto the things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. There is a oneness. There's a declaration of oneness together. And as it says in Romans chapter number 15, that, we, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus. I venture to think, and again, sports analogies in the spiritual realm just really don't fit all the time. We use a few of them, and, and they sound pretty fun, but think of this today. What time do the Chiefs play today? 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 1 o'clock, what? 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock, can't wait, hallelujah. Now, did the Chiefs win the Super Bowl last year? Three of you think that they did. Well, it actually happened. They won the Super Bowl back in February, right? And when they did that, oh, that Andy Reid brought this team together. They got so many weapons. They're so great. You know what? He's a unifier. He knows how to bring the team together. He's a great head coach. You know the reason why they won? is because they took that field as one. Well, duh. Every single winner says the same thing. Go back and look at all the recordings. Now that you get the crazy YouTube, unless they stink and take it plat off the platform, then you can't watch it. YouTube, you're crazy. But here, think about this. This statement about all the sports stuff. The reason they won is because they all came together. Well, duh. Church. Yes, I'm saying it loud enough. My goodness. The head coach is the chief shepherd. He's not a coach. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the chief shepherd of your church. He's the one you answer to. That's the beginning point. He is the unifier in the Holy Ghost to do so. And it's interesting that when they went with one accord in the temple, house to house, gladness and singleness and heart, praising God, favor with all people, that, oh, that was good for them, but what about us? Well, this last statement is this. When you continue for his glory, there ought to be a provocation to give him glory. Our provocation is his glorification. When you provoke something, the Bible teaches in Hebrews about us provoking one another to get together. Well, I wonder, do you really, really provoke one another to get together? Is it because you're going to be the great grand poo that's going to bring everybody together for you? Or is it going to be because we unify and come together in the name of Jesus Christ? For the Lord Jesus Christ. That our declaration is something that's very, very clear about being unified. And the provocation. What provokes you is this his glorification. Does Jesus Christ really get the glory out of my life? Does Jesus Christ really get the glory out of the church's life, blood, and the fruit of the work that the church does? Let me finish by walking through a few verses with you real quick. Acts chapter number 11, verse number 18. 
When you turn here and you follow along with me, I'm just going to read a few of these. And I want you to see this beautiful provocation that brings glorification. What does it mean for provocation? It's something that arouses a strong response from another. Let me say it again. Something that arouses a strong response from another. And then the words excitement, in excitement, incitement, instigation come. Oh, I'm so excited for this. I'm so excited for this. I, I can't wait for the game. I'm so excited for this. Do you understand how our provocation for the glorification of the flesh is so much more paramount sometimes than the gl glorification of Jesus Christ? We should be provoking one another to get together for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid to do it. Stand out like a, a crazy person. Why are we getting together? Why are we open to the coffee house? Why are we having the investors? Why are we having the Sunday groups? Why are we having the kids? For the glory of the Lord. Is that hard? You say, I know that Bible lesson. Well, then why in the world is it we know it so well, but yet it doesn't happen very much? I will tell you that I hear way too much glorying on the wrong people, on the wrong particular credit. But everybody will unify for Randy Reed and the Kansas City Chiefs on what great job he did coaching. You know how much that matters in the kingdom of God? Zero! But you know what matters? You giving glory to Jesus Christ. Me giving glory to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, glory to God in the highest. Victory in Jesus. I'm very concerned about the church. They were provoked to so many things, but we're not provoked to glorifying Jesus Christ. And when you think of the book of Acts, let's get it on, church, because the bottom line is the time is short, and people are watching you and me, and they're still wondering. You see, you say that every week. No kidding. It must be the Holy Ghost has got it upon me. It's in my heart. I need to get turned upside down by God, and maybe he'll turn me upside down again. It's fine for his glory. Verse number 18, chapter number 11, I'll finish up here. And when they heard these things, they held their peace, and they glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Hallelujah. When people were preached to, and the word of God changed their lives, and the gospel changed their lives, it's like the angels dancing in heaven. They were giving glory to God here on this earth. We're going to have baptisms in a couple weeks. There ought to be jumping and shouting. There should be people coming in there and going, I need to get baptized because I got saved. But maybe you can't continue for his glory today because you've never been saved. Maybe when you look at these Bible verses, you see 1 Corinthians 6, for you bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You go, I've never been bought with a price. I've never given my life to Jesus Christ. I've never been saved. Well, goodness gracious me. For the glory of God, you need to come on the name, call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. Because that will give him the ultimate glory. Because he's the only one that can give you new life. This world can change your life a little bit, but Jesus Christ will give you new life. He is doing it. Let's give thanks. We continue for his glory. So the question in our invitation time, as we are going to come to this time, and you can come forward, you can deal with any need here, you come and pray. If you're lost and you want to get saved, you can come forward. I'll have somebody talk to you about that. But i got to ask you this. Will uncommon, look at the wall and see the, the artwork and see the phrase about uncommon, which we just had that conference two months ago. Will uncommon be the testimony of the faithful believers of First Bible Baptist Church in 2021? I pray that it is. Would you please bow your heads for a word of prayer as we go into our time of prayer and our time of invitation. There'll be some music playing in the background, and I'm going to pray for you right now, and I pray you'll respond. It's a safe place to come up here and deal with business as only you and the Lord can deal with business. Thank you, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for your precious holy word. Each word, line upon line, precept upon precept, it speaks of you. It declares your glory. It allows us to identify with you and to realize that there's no one but you. And it makes us realize that if we're going to continue for your glory, holy God, then we need to maybe just get some things right. I know in my life I've had to get a lot of things right, and I continue, Lord God, to make things right with you. I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for your love. And I appreciate it, and I'm so grateful to you for changing my life for all of eternity. 
Now I pray for my brothers and sisters in the Lord, many of them that truly are in a place where they want to continue for you, that you'll tug in their hearts and maybe do some business with you today. And I pray for those that are lost, that maybe have never called on the name of the Lord, that you, God, would make this their day to really, truly be burdened for salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we have our time of invitation. As the music plays, please come.